What's up everyone? Minesh, the psychedelic scientist here. Welcome to my channel where I provide discussions of the latest findings and developments in psychedelic science in a way that's easy to understand but not superficial at the same time. In this video, I'm going to dive into the question of whether the psychedelic experience itself is necessary for the positive therapeutic benefits some people get with these drugs. Before I start today, I just want to say that the editing for this video was sponsored by MindLeap Health, which is a mental health platform that provides easy access to psychedelic integration specialists through a smartphone app. So go check out the link in the description to check them out. So this question of whether the psychedelic experience is necessary for positive benefits has been coming up more and more, both in the research world in terms of two papers that just came out, each of them arguing for either side. And also in the business world where multiple companies are now trying to create so-called second generation psychedelics which allow positive benefits without the psychedelic trip. Now I'm sure that a lot of us have really strong opinions about this, but in this video I just wanted to give it a fair assessment and outline the main arguments on each side to see what conclusion we can get to. So let's jump right in. So first I'm going to start with three of the main arguments for the idea that psychedelic experience is necessary for the positive benefits. So the first one is that multiple research studies have found that there is a correlation between the degree to which subjects have mystical experiences during their trip and the positive benefits they get. This has been in a number of different contexts. There's been correlations between reductions in depression symptoms and mystical experience, between reductions in anxiety and mystical experience, between reductions in smoking and mystical experience, and also just increased well-being in healthy people the more they had a mystical experience. And in another study where they gave psilocybin to meditators, they found that the extent to which the psilocybin gave them greater positive benefits was associated with how much it induced a mystical experience in them. And so all these studies, which are distinct samples in distinct clinical populations, all seem to suggest that mystical experience plays an important role in mediating positive outcomes with psychedelics. What's also important is that in these studies, the effect that mystical experience had seems to be over and above experience intensity alone. Because somebody could just say like, oh, this correlation is there because mystical experience happens when they have a more intense experience overall. So it's like, no, not necessarily. And statistical analyses have shown that the effect that mystical experience has is not there for this intensity of effects. So the second argument is that psychedelics can produce personal insights into people which then lead to the positive benefits. And this is of course what a lot of people go into an experience wanting. They want to get some insight into their situation in life, who they are, resolve things from their past and so on and get a new perspective. And this is also what subjects in these clinical trials often report. Not only that, but there are quantitative associations found in multiple studies between the extent to which they had personal insights and the extent to which they experienced positive outcomes. What's interesting here is that analyses have also shown that this personal insight mediated positive benefit seems to be at least partially independent of the mystical experience benefits. So it seems that having a mystical experience, having this blissful oneness with the universe, seems to be critical for positive benefits, but at the same time you could not have a mystical experience and just have insights into your problems and this also leads to positive benefits. Or of course these things can both happen, which is maybe often the case when a mystical experience does happen. And a third argument, which is not really independent of the first two, relates to what subjects report when they're interviewed after their experience. There's one study in particular that interviewed the patients after they underwent psychedelically assisted psychotherapy for depression, and they asked them, did this treatment work for you, and if so, how? And the two major themes that emerged from this was a sense of a deepening of connectedness to themselves, to the world, and to others, and an ability to emotionally accept their problems and forgive people who had wronged them in the past. And so again, it seems to suggest that at least by their own assessment, they found that the subjective experiences they went to had a critical role in the positive benefits that they got. And so collectively, we can see from the arguments for the idea that psychedelic experience is necessary, is that based on both quantitative analyses and also qualitative reports based on interviews with people, that the extent to which they experienced mystical experience, the extent to which they had personal insights into life situation and problems, and also the extent to which they had emotional breakthroughs and felt this deepening of connectedness to the world. All these things seem to be associated with the positive benefits that they're getting. So with all this said, let's dive into some of the arguments on the other side. So one of the core aspects of this argument is that correlation doesn't imply causation. It might be the case that all these things are correlated with positive outcomes, but we don't know really if they're essential or causing them. And the reasoning behind this is that there might be some underlying brain mechanisms which are leading the positive benefits, which just so happen to co-occur with these experiences. So in this sense, some of these experiences are just epiphenomena, 
or just things that happen without causing anything or without actually changing. This whole argument hinges on the idea that psychedelics can be classified as psychoplastogens, which just means that they're a class of compounds which can potently increase neuroplasticity. And something that's interesting, independent of research with psychedelics, is that individuals who are undergoing a mental health condition such as depression seem to have pathologically reduced neuroplasticity. So essentially their brains are becoming more rigid. And in these patients, they're having studies where they injected different proteins and compounds which increase the amount of neuroplasticity in your brain, things such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF, and that injecting these compounds alone decrease their depressive symptoms without them undergoing any type of experience from it. So the idea from these kind of studies and others is that there seems to be some positive benefit that comes from neuroplasticity alone. And let me just describe a couple more examples of this. So one is ketamine. And what's interesting is that ketamine, although it acts on a very different brain system than LSD and psilocybin, it doesn't act on the serotonin system at all. It is a potent psychoplastogen, so it does increase neuroplasticity a lot. And also, in standard medical approaches with ketamine, they devalue the experience and basically see the experience it induces as an unwanted side effect. This is in contrast to highlighting the personal content and memory that occurs and how it can produce insight. But as I said, it still seems to have this positive effect. With the catch being that a lot of the times this effect only lasts a week or two and that subjects have to undergo repeated dosing with ketamine. Suggesting the importance of the neuroplasticity inducing effects for ketamine's uh, positive benefits, there have been multiple studies with mice showing this. <music> including one published last year in the prestigious journal Science which found a direct causal relationship between ketamine-induced neuroplasticity and antidepressant-like effects in mice. Two more examples are recent synthetic analogs of ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT. For both of these, they were found to have antidepressant, anti-addictive, and neuroplasticity-inducing effects without leading to the characteristic psychedelic effects that we see in mice after they take a psychedelic. And so the argument here was that here are these different versions of these drugs which perhaps don't induce a psychedelic experience, but do induce neuroplasticity and are showing the positive effects. Again, this is in mice though. So collectively, these studies offer some support of, to the idea that neuroplasticity alone can induce positive benefits in individuals, perhaps in humans with ketamine, and also in these mice model with these other analogs and other drugs. And the thought underlying all this is that by inducing neuroplasticity, your brain is able to make changes under the hood, so to speak, which alter previously rigid brain circuits in positive ways. So again, the idea that the psychedelic experience might not be necessary for the positive benefits is based on this neuroplasticity argument. An important point of consideration in all this is that this heavily relies on research done in mice. And there are, of course, a number of limitations to this. For one, it, we are limited in our ability to know whether a mouse is going through a psychedelic experience or what that even would mean on a subjective level for that mouse. How it's usually indexed by researchers is through the so-called head twitch response. Basically, they found that if you give some LSD or psilocybin to a mouse, they twitch their head more. And this is the same with other 5-HD2A agonist psychedelics. And then when you look at how they're measuring antidepressant effects in mice, this is often done through what's called the four swim test. In this test, they basically put a mouse in a cylinder of water where it can't escape and measure how long it tries to escape even though it can't. And the idea is that the less depressed they are, the longer they'll try to frantically escape. And this has been shown with standard antidepressants that work in humans, that if you give a mouse an antidepressant, they'll spend more time trying to frantically escape. And they're less likely to fall into this immobile, passive, and helpless state. And so I think it goes without saying that going from these mice models, to the complex multidimensionality of the psychedelic experience in humans and all of the complex and variable forms that depression can take is a huge jump to make. For example, what would it even mean for a mouse to have personal insight into their problems? The answer is it wouldn't mean anything because they don't have the memory ability or the cognitive ability to even do that. So can we really equate the extent to which they don't fall into a helpless state while trying to swim for their lives? with the complex psychological correlates of being in a depressed state and the various reasons that you can be in that state? I think that's kind of crazy. <laughs> First, I think we critically need studies in humans which try to dissociate the neuroplastic effect of psychedelics from the experience side of it. This can mean having neuroplasticity without experience or having experience without neuroplasticity. I think the first one, neuroplasticity without experience, might be more feasible. 
One of the things that research suggested in one of the recent papers was giving a psychedelic to somebody after they were heavily sedated and put to sleep and to see if that still gives them positive benefits. And so I do think it is compelling and most likely the case that inducing neuroplasticity alone can lead to some positive benefits. Again, by providing the brain with more resources to rewire maladaptive or negative circuits. But I do think that for these circuits to be encoded in an ideal and lasting way, there needs to be some experiential component. There needs to be some kind of psychological breakthrough or shift in perspective that leads the brain to function in a different way, which will then will be encoded by using the neuroplastic resources that psychedelics also allow. So the idea is that this neuroplastic effect and experience effect might be partially distinct in the brain, but in a usual psychedelic experience that's done in a supportive context and in the right way, these things synergize to create the rapid and lasting benefits that we're getting. So my hunch is that there's two mechanisms at play in the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. One is this non-experience based neuroplasticity effect, which occurs under the hood of your brain and helps rewire certain maladaptive brain circuits and helps provide the rigid brain of a patient with some more resources to make the changes it might be wanting to make. And two, there's also another mechanism that allows psychedelics to get positive effects that depends critically on the experience. It depends on the psychological breakthroughs you go through, the insights you have, the changes in perspective that a mystical experience allows, a deeper sense of connectedness to oneself and others and the world as a whole, ability to accept our past and integrate emotional wounds. I think all these things are needed to fully tap into the lasting positive benefits that psychedelics can give somebody. And I also think this is a way of making the most of the increased neuroplasticity that these drugs also induce. And this all hinges as well on proper integration of your experience and making a conscious effort to maintain those new brain circuits through our psychology, maintain those new ways of thinking and perceiving the world so they get encoded within our brain. So that's all I have for this video. Let me know what you think about this discussion and whether there are other arguments on either side that I missed. And don't forget to show me some love by hitting that like button and subscribing for more videos on the latest in psychedelic science.